Thank you, Connie. Uh, first, can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Ross? All right, in online. Welcome. First, I want to thank our wonderful sponsors. There are many people who are responsible for helping to pull this together over many, many months. Um, the Department of Library and Information Science, the department that I'm a part of, thank you, the School of Communication and Information, um, as well as the Office of Undergraduate Academic Affairs, the Paul Robeson Cultural Center, as well as the Office of Diversity and Inclusion. And I would be remiss if we didn't thank our sponsors, so let's give them all. So what we're going to do is I'm going to uh, just talk a little bit about the the film and transitioning to our topic, which is activism, social activism, and use of technology in social media, okay? And I'm going to introduce our speaker, our distinguished speaker, Dale Long. Then we'll invite the panel to come up. They'll say a few words, each, each panelist will say a few words to introduce the topic, and then we will have a discussion, a and a okay? We'll have a mic in the audience for you to use. Uh, that's for the folks in the room as well as the folks online. And we'll have a, a mic up here as well for the speaker. Okay, with that. I think any conversation about social justice is incomplete without mentioning Paul Robeson, especially on this campus. This is one of my favorite, if there is one, quotes from Robeson. He is one of the most revered civil rights activists in the world. And in this quote is in his testimony from the 1956 House Un-American Activities Committee. He defiantly declares that he will remain in this country despite the hardships that he might have endured here. So I want to make sure that we appropriately frame our conversation about social justice, especially in the context of what we just saw, in some ways a very sad, calm event in this country's history. But in other ways, it actually helps to inspire uh, us, all of us, as we think about what we can do to participate in making this a better place for all of us. In my view, social activism is really about love, about a deep appreciation for the potential of individuals in our collective. Baldwin was an elegant and thoughtful critic from within America as well as from outside its shores. And his time overseas gave him a perspective on his activism and the home he missed. Upon his return from Paris to the United States, he expressed this, I have missed my brothers and my sisters and my mother. I hope that they wouldn't forget me. I miss Harlem Sunday mornings and fried chicken and biscuits. I miss the music. I miss the style. I miss, in short, my connections. Miss the life which had produced me and nourished me and paid for me. Now, though I was a stranger, I was home. Let's return to Birmingham. What do we have to do with four girls being killed before church on a Sunday morning? What's the relevance today? What can we glean from these horrific events? How can it educate and inform? and perhaps even inspire our own law. Dr. King, a few short months prior to the 16th Street Baptist Church bombing, spent time in Birmingham. And during his incarceration, he penned a masterpiece. He penned a masterpiece that helps guide the fight for social justice and activism. He makes the point that it matters, then and now, to all of us. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects us all indirectly. 
would have been quite a tweet. Mm. <laughs> I think Dr. King would have been a hell of a father. <coughs> Let me introduce our speaker, Dale. Dale was born in Tuskegee, but shortly after moved to Birmingham. In 1970, he accepted a scholarship, a music scholarship at Texas Southern University, where he received his bachelor's degree in 1974. He's currently the senior information officer, public information officer for the city of Dallas. In this capacity, he provides media relations and community outreach. I think he can provide an interesting and unique perspective to the events of the day in Birmingham that we just witnessed because he was in the church when it was bombed and has direct connections to many of the individuals and places and events depicted in the film. His accomplishments since then are too, too great to, to list here. Uh, in 1990, I'll list a couple, Dale petitioned the national body of his fraternity and my to include the Big Brothers and Sisters as one of its national programs. You see, Dale took the events that he went through, the bombing and others, before and after, and he decided to build a life of service. And he's been recognized across the country for that. In June 1989, he was named National Big Brother of the Year by Big Brothers and Sisters of America. And during that time, Dale was invited to the White House by former President George Bush, George H. Bush, to assist him in announcing his Thousand Points of Light initiative. The only President Bush spoke before thousands assembled on the South Lawn of the White House. In July 2004, to commemorate the 40th anniversary of the signing of the 1964 Civil Rights Act, President George Bush shared with the White House guests one of Dale's childhood civil rights era stories growing up in Birmingham. And he has been gracious enough to share a piece of that with us today. Join me in giving a warm Rutgers Black History Month celebration welcome to my friend, my friend, the Bible. This is my it is, it is, and I ain't jumping today. Uh, well, I'm, I ain't gonna prove, I'm not gonna prove it today. Thank you, Charles. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you man. Thank you. Thank you. Let's go get it. Good evening, Rutgers, and thank you again, Charles, for that warm introduction to Connie. Thank you for setting this up for us, and it's a pleasure to be here. I think you all will agree that um, that was quite a film that we just witnessed. Um, I've seen it probably 10 or 12 times. I have my own copy at home. There's a little booklet that goes along with that, and I can't see it enough because it brings back fond members of Birmingham, but very poignant, tough times in Birmingham. As Charles said that there are a lot of people who were depicted in the film that have personal relationships. And when I go back to Birmingham, I go to 16th Street Church and I visit the Civil Rights Institute across the street just to make sure I remember the things that I experienced as a child growing up in Birmingham. Let me just lay the lay Birmingham out for you in the 50s and 60s. Imagine going to a department store, trying on a pair of shoes, right? Just, you know, bring me size 10 or size 11. Not in Birmingham. My mother would have to take our little feet and trace it with an ink pen on a piece of paper and take it to the department store at Burger Phillips and Pazitz and present that to the attendant and they would have to use that to determine our shoe size because we were not allowed to try on shoes. Just imagine, as Mr. McNair said, going, taking your kid to shopping and you could smell the hamburgers and stuff cooking in the restaurants and the department stores, but my mother and dad would always say, don't ask to go, because we're not gonna do that. Because meanwhile, my folks' hamburgers taste better anyway. You know, the ones that they fixed, they didn't use buns, it was bread, right, the, the sandwich bread. So we look forward to that. Don't go to the bathroom. Don't use the water fountain. It was the one that got me the most. We would pass by Kitty Land Park in the evening. This was the amusement park that was on the grounds of the Alabama State Fairground. 
you can see the Ferris wheel and you can hear the music, you can smell the popcorn and peanuts going. And we would ask our dad and mom all the time, well, why can't we go there? We, we, why can't we go? And you know, when I was thinking about it, I really didn't know anybody that went to Kitty Land Park. The deal was we weren't allowed to go because we were African American. Anybody in this room ever heard of the term reckless eyeballing? Mr. Jones, I know you know. Reckless eyeballing, anybody? Anybody, want to take a guess? Where's Stacy? Stacy, stand up please, if you don't mind. Stacy, you look very lovely this evening. I really like your attire and your hair is just gorgeous and you're such a beautiful lady. Thank you so much for being here. You may take your seat now. That's reckless eyeballing. If you were African American and you showed any type of fondness in a, in a such a way that whoever was watching figured something was wrong with it, you could lose your life over just what I just did. Just saying hello and make, paying a compliment because you weren't supposed to see white women in that light at all. I, I was joking with Charles earlier. I said, you know, I've, I've done yoga for the last nine years. That was a kiss of death if my dad had tried to do that 50 or 60 years ago. Birmingham was a tough place to be. You know, every now and then my parents would take us to the movie. Y'all remember the movie, The Shaggy Dog? This was a Disney film where the man turned himself into a dog every now and then. Well, we begged our parents to take us. They got a new one out now. Well, it came out a couple of years ago, but this was the one that came out in the 60s. And we begged our parents to take us in. My dad finally consented to do it. Never will forget that day we pulled in front of the Melba Theater. I jumped out of the car first and ran to the front of the theater. I don't know what I was doing. I'd seen it done on TV a bunch of times. My dad finally jumped out and said, no, son, come on, go with me. I said, Dad, you don't understand. We got to pay here first. But he sadly bowed his head and he grabbed us by the hand. My brother and I took us around to an alley, a dark alley dark, cold, wet alley, and we talked to someone that we couldn't see because of the inadequate lighting, and they, my dad presented a $20 bill for our fee, and they said, we don't have change. You, boy, you got to go somewhere else and get it. So we had to get back in the car and go to a business, come back, and of course, that parking space wasn't there, so we parked, parked blocks away. But we finally made it back. We paid our fee, and then here's where it got me. We walked up some stairs to the crow's nest that Carol's sister talked about. We walked up these stairs and our little feet stuck to the carpet because they were so filthy and they didn't have any lights as I see in here that will guide you safely to the balcony. But finally when we got there, we sat out and God knows what because they didn't clean it. And we sat there best we could to enjoy that film, but I knew then that was why our parents wanted to spare us of having to go through such an ordeal just to try it your best you can to enjoy a movie. And I learned then. You know, my parents used to vote in Birmingham. We, we vo they voted at uh, Graymont Elementary School, which was a block from my house. We couldn't go to school there, but they voted there. And I remember asking my mom before she passed away, it looked like every time y'all went to vote, you would take the two of us with, with you when you went to vote. Why'd you do that? She said, well, we were, very, we were like, less likely to be harassed if kids were with us. I said, y'all were using us, right? Sort of kind of were, but I understood what they were doing. They had to pay poll taxes to vote. They had to pass a literacy exam, and sometimes it was the most ridiculous stuff you've ever heard of. They would hold up a jar of jelly beans and say, how many beans in this jar? Oh, here's the one that got me. How many bubbles in a bar of soap? And they would use that to deny people the right to vote. Sometimes my parents would get dumb questions like that, and they would just be persistent. Sir, ma'am, I'm here to vote. And pretty soon they'd let them do it just to get rid of them. Look how difficult it was for people of color, African-American people, to just say, I'm a part of this country, and I want to exercise my right to vote. And the right that was given to them as human beings years prior but not so in Birmingham. Brown versus Board of Education was around, what, 54. And everybody knows the story of Rosa Parks, who was down in Montgomery. 
She was a secretary with the uh, NAACP. She was a seamstress at a department store. She'd had a busy day at work and she boarded the bus. Now back then in Montgomery and in Birmingham and throughout the South, a lot of times you would be asked to, if you were African American, you pay your fee on the front of the bus, then you would have to exit the bus go in through the back door and then sit at the very back. You wouldn't dare pay and then walk down that aisle because that aisle was not for you. It was for white people. And as the bus began to fill up with white people, you had to stand up. It didn't matter how old you were or whether or not you were amputee or had babies or pregnant or whatever or sick, or you had to stand up. And this day, Rosa Parks decided she just wasn't going to do it. And so in an act of defiance, Ms. Parks, you know the story, was arrested in Montgomery, Alabama, locked up, and the local ministers there were trying to figure out how to deal with that, and they called upon a young minister who was new to town, and that was Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., who took the leadership in what was known as the Montgomery Improvement Association that later became the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. Uh, Y.T. Walker talked about it was organized in New Orleans, and there were ministers throughout the South that raised money and created a staff to deal with issues like that. And so besides the very successful uh, boycott in Montgomery, they did a very successful boycott in Birmingham too, and that meant nobody, not a single African American, rode the bus. And it proved to be an economic burden on the city of Birmingham that owned the transit authority back then. Well, not only was the bus an issue, but it was accommodations, and you couldn't go to the restaurants. You could buy your clothes at the department store, but they wouldn't hire you to work there. And so there were so many things going on in Birmingham. There was police brutality that Dr. King and Shuttlesworth and several others decided to take it a step further. So they decided to protest, which is where 16th Street Church came into play. Mr. Wyatt Walker mentioned that 16th Street Church was strategically situated in Birmingham. It was a block from uh, A.G. Gasson Motel where many of the uh, leaders in the movement lived and it was a, uh, right across the street from Kelly Ingram Park and maybe two or three blocks from the county courthouse and city hall. And in most cases, that's where the demonstrators were trying to go. Just walk over to city hall and pray. But in most cases, they never got there but they, because of being met with dogs and fire hoses and uh, police brutality. So typically, the uh, people would show up at 16th Street Church. Now, it's interesting to note that the attempt initially was done by adults volunteering to go out and demonstrate. But they later learned that once they were locked up for a couple of days and then released from jail and attempted to go back to their jobs, they found that they had no job. So that didn't prove to make a whole lot of sense when you were creating situations where kids weren't being able to be fed or pay rent or buy gasoline or whatever you do with your money because the parents, because of being involved in the demonstrations, could not keep their job. So they decided to go to using kids. And that was a very tough time for my parents because during this time, uh, our best buddies, my brother Kenneth and I, our best buddy was Al and Derek King, which were Dr. King's um, nephews. A.D. King was, was their dad, and we all went to Brunetta Hill School together, and we hung out together. We were best buddies. And, you know, at that point, I'd seen Dr. King on television. I'd seen him in Jet and Ebony and Newsweek and all of that, but I'd never seen the man in person. And by that time, I'd already formulated an idea because of his oratory and because of his bravery that I would see on TV that he was the greatest man ever walked the earth during my lifetime. And I wanted to see that man so bad. Just lay eyes on him. I remember being at uh, his brother's home, Al and Derek's house on a Saturday. We were keeping up a lot of noise as boys do. And their mom said, guys, y'all need to take all that noise out to the backyard because Uncle Mel is trying to get some rest in the room. I said, hey, wait a minute. You mean Dr. King is right on the other side of that door? And she said, yes. And I wanted so bad to just bust in there to see for myself, but I knew what was going to happen if I did that, and I was too smart to do that. And the other part was I wanted to make sure that we were allowed to come back and visit with them again because I knew had I done that, 
I never, we never would have been able to go back to that house again, but I finally got my chance to see Dr. King a little bit later, and I'll share that with you. During the uh, boycotts in Birmingham, and that meant you didn't buy anything downtown Birmingham. If it was, it was Easter season, and we were accustomed to getting new suits and ties and shoes and stuff, and no, you wore what you had. A lot of times you would see grown men and especially ministers going to church in overalls. You wear what you had as an act of defiance because we understood that the department stores prepared. They stocked up at Easter because they knew black folks was going to go shopping and buy new Easter dresses and new outfits and big hats and whatever it is we buy. But the movement said, don't do it. And if you dare go down there anyway, they had some people waiting on you to make sure that you won't go back again. They might destroy what you have and say, but well, see, can you use it now? And if people did shop, they would go over to Atlanta or they would, if they could afford to, you know, come out this way or somewhere else to keep from defying the movement because the people in Birmingham, the college students at Miles College were dead serious about it. So Birmingham during the, um, uh, uh, the children's movement of 1963, now, you know, as I, Arrived late last night, and I got up this morning, and I turned on TV. I've become a CNN junkie here recently. Uh, Y'all have to tell me why. I don't know. But I was watching TV, and it dawned on me that there's a parallel between the movement that's going on in Florida right now. If you've been watching the news, I know many of you students. When I was a student, I didn't watch much news, but you can't help but see at various news outlets the kids in Florida who are appear to be dead serious about bringing their plight to, to their attention. They were at the uh, state capitol in Tallahassee today, and they're planning to go to the White House, I think March 5th, to express their views to the president. Isn't it interesting how history repeats itself? But we, it's a different dynamic now because we're talking about affluent white kids who went to the capitol on nice buses and were allowed to come in and talk, but just they didn't get arrested or beat up or shot down with fire hoses or anything like that. They heard them and when they went on about that. When, when they go up to Washington, D.C., they'd hop on a plane and fly there. But it was all so different in Birmingham. My parents wouldn't let me demonstrate as a means of protecting me. And it was problematic, this whole issue for them, because Al and Derek, again, were our best buddies, and we were hearing about the movement directly from them. So they struggled and struggled and struggled, and they kept close tabs on me. The Armstrong brothers who lived behind us, their dad was a barber. And so they demonstrated, and they eventually integrated the Greenmont School where my parents voted. But during this time, the FBI sat between the two houses in the alley for two years, guarding their home. And they told our parents to keep an eye on us because we were the same age. We almost looked alike, and the Klan didn't care who they got. And during the time when they integrated Greymont School, these kids were walked to school every day by the FBI, and they sat in the classroom with them just to protect them. My parents didn't really want to send us through that type of pressure. During the, this time, Dr. King was locked up, and this is where he wrote the the letter from a Birmingham jail that Charles alluded to a little bit earlier. The A.G. Gasson Motel that was down the street from the church was bombed on May, tw May 12th. And my brother and I woke up Sunday morning to find all these people in the house, and we later learned that's why they were there, because our dad worked there, and he was temporarily trapped inside of the home. But when we struggled with all of these things in Birmingham. My mom and dad did the very best they could to counsel us, but inevitably they would take us next door to, to our maternal grandmother, Nanny, we called her. And she would try and explain to us about bad and evil, and good and white and all of this. I said, well, wait a minute. What about Jesus loved the little children, red and yellow, black, and white? That song. And she would struggle with it, but she would always end up saying, boys, if you Pray, have faith, walk upright, and get a good education. That'll lead you out of this situation of segregation and hatred that you see every day in Birmingham. After the motel was bombed, a few weeks later was the uh, March on Washington that was mentioned in the film. 
And then a few weeks after that, schools in Birmingham were integrated just by a handful of people. And again, I wasn't part of that group because my parents chose not to allow us to do that. But I had several friends, including the Armstrong boys, behind us. September 15th was a typical day of Sunday school, youth day. I played in the church orchestra, Denise and Carol, um, Addie and Cynthia, they were all involved in um, some of the activities for that day. Uh, Reverend Cross was a family friend. When he first moved to Birmingham, he stayed with my grandmother. We knew him well. And the theme for that youth day was the love that forgives, ironically. And it was right after Sunday school, about 10, 25, 10, 22 or so, that there were boys, it was all of us, we were all boys and we were in the church library where our Sunday school class was held and it was in the basement and all of a sudden the room started to shake, there was soot, there was smoke, the lights went out so you couldn't really see what was happening and we had no idea what was going on. I tried to run out because I knew that church like the back of my hand despite the lighting and I was met by a police officer. Now, you know, response time for a, a cop nowadays is what? seven minutes with fast cars and computers. But ironically, this officer met me as I was trying to run up the steps out of the basement. He was coming down. He said, nigga, get back in there. And I ran right past him. I got on the outside and there was an eerie feeling. And after a few seconds, I, it dawned on me. I said, this church has been bombed because I could smell the gunpowder in there. And I guess you wonder, well, why, well, how you know about that? You're 11 years old, cap pistols. And fireworks, we all had experience with those growing up, and we knew what it was. And people were looking for their friends, their siblings, their loved ones, their kids. And it dawned on me I hadn't seen my brother. So I went back in the church, back in the basement, where my, and I went to the classroom where he should have been, and it was dark, and I yelled his name, and nobody was there. Grabbed the clarinet on the way out, and then finally I saw him with my grandmother's best friend, his Sunday school teacher. Ms. McCall, and I grabbed his hand and I made sure he was okay and held on to him until my dad came from the A.G. Gaston Motel about a block away, and he too went through this deal about making sure we were okay. He finally got us back down to his office and made a phone call finally and got through to mom who was at home and said, I found the boys, they're okay. And she made her way down to the A.G. Gaston Motel, and I remember her jumping out of the car before she put it in park. Uh, she was busy trying to get to us to make sure we were okay. And she took us home. We drove up. My aunt and grandmother who lived next door was standing in the front yard, and we had to go through the whole experience of explaining to them what happened to us. And they made sure we were all right, and we went through the tears and the hugs and all of that. And at the end of that day, around 4 or 5 o'clock that evening, we found out that 27 people had been taken to the hospital, and Denise Carroll Addis Cynthia had lost their lives. And there were two boys killed that day, one by the police officer and another one by a teenager who was an Eagle Scout who just shot him. The other kid was killed by the police for throwing a rock. So there were six kids who lost their lives that day, September 15th. And we were devastated by that because, see, there was no counseling for African-American boys and girls after living through such a traumatic experience. But that was Nanny, my grandmother. And she took us to her side and she comforted us the best she could. But once again, she said, boys, if you want to get beyond this, you need to pray, have faith, walk upright, and get a good education. But she added something different to today. That this day, she said, you were spared for a reason. Could have been four little boys versus four little girls. You need to make something of yourselves. Do something for somebody else. Make your life committed to something. And I had no idea that years later I would discover big brothers, big sisters, and been doing that for 40 years, just being a mentor to a young man. And at this point, seven young men over the last 40 years. Y'all can clap for that. <laughs> so, so, so we struggled with, 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 with the things that we had experienced in Birmingham. And I'm about to wrap this up. Three days later, when they had the mass funeral, Dr. King mentioned the, the funeral and he was the eulogist. Right after the funeral was over, he happened to come out of the church and there he was standing there with his robe on, with that look on his face. And it looked like every time I looked this way, he was staring right at me. And I tried to look away and I turned around and he was looking right at me. And I called it that my epiphany experience. So when you combine that 
with what my grandmama said about praying, have faith, walk upright, getting out of education. That's something that I'll never forget. So when my girls, my young adult girls, talk to me about race, and especially when my little brother, Montel, who is 14, when he talks about Trayvon Martin and the things that happens to black kids his age today, and I struggle with trying to explain to him why things like that happen. I always go back to what Nanny told us 50, 60 years ago, and that is to pray, have faith, walk upright, get a good education, make something of yourselves, do something for somebody else, and I have to tell him every now and then, pull his pants up. Thank y'all for allowing me to share with you. Appreciate it. There are questions and answers later on, right? Okay. Thank you, Dale. Thank you. With that, we're going to introduce our panel, our distinguished panel. Melanie Price, Associate Professor of African Studies and a graduate of Prairie View A&L. Oh, man. Yeah. <laughs> Dr. Dr. Price is the author of Dreaming Blackness, Black Nationalism and African American Public Opinion and the Race Whisperer of Barack Obama and the Political Uses of Race. She's an important voice in social movements and political psychology. So let's welcome Melanie. I've invited each of the panelists just to say a, a couple of opening words before we, come on up, come on up. And, and we'll, uh, we'll get all the panel up here and then we'll open it up. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, what am I supposed to do now? Okay. So, should I sit down, should I sing, should I? Okay, I'm gonna sit down. So, I wrote down some notes of, can everybody hear me? Okay, I wrote down some notes of things I was going to say, and then I heard the introduction of Mr. Dale Long here, and I grew up in Houston, from the southeast side of town. Mm -hmm. I spent much of my life moving back and forth from Texas Southern University. It is very familiar to me. One of my sisters <coughs> has a degree from there. Mm -hmm. But then I had some good sense, <laughs> and I went to a college a little further mm -hmm. away, another black college called Prairie View A&M University, and every Labor Day, his alma mater and my alma mater meet up for mostly a battle of the band. Absolutely. And absolutely every time, the marching storm of Prairie View A&M University. All right, all right, all right. So much for that. <laughs> so it's exciting to be here. I'm an ocean of soul man, too, you know? I'm sorry about that. So I wanted to offer a little levity before then. It's really amazing you don't meet a lot. I mean, in this part of the country, we don't meet a lot of us around. When I was thinking about four little girls and what I was gonna to say today, one of the things that became very important to me was that, for, that the, these little girls and the importance of their presence in our national memory reminds, of, reminds us of the fact that women and girls were not absolved from white supremacist violence. Oftentimes in our understanding of the South and the South's relationship to white supremacist violence, we focus a lot on the ways in which men were impacted by this experience, particularly on the impact of lynching. It's important to note, by the way, that women were also lynched. Mm -hmm. Also, I'm from the state of Texas where Mexicans were also lynched. And so the history of lynching is far more complicated. But I think it's also important to talk about the ways that it underestimates um, or sometimes completely ignores the visible ways that violence was experienced by women and girls. And so this bombing is an example of that, but also physical violence and sexual assault are all things um, that women experienced, Fannie Lou Hamer. Mm. Um, lots of women talk about this while they were in jail. I think it's interesting too to talk about this way in which this also happens sometimes now where the focus on sort of a male-centered version of police violence, especially those caught on tape, ignore the ways in which black women and girls are also being impacted by white supremacist and vigilante violence. I would like to point to two things in particular um, that I think are worth mentioning. The first thing is the Say Her Name movement led by the African American Public Policy Institute where it is an effort to recognize those women who were also who have also experienced police and vigilante violence. 
So black women make up, make up about 13% of the female population in the United States, but they make up a full third or 33% of all women shot by police. And so as we think about the names of Trayvon Martin and Mike Brown, Eric Garner, it is important that we also say her name. We say the name of Rakia Boyd or Maya ha Megan Hockaday or Tanisha Anderson or Sandra, Sandra Bland who was mm -hmm. killed at my TV. feet away from my own alma mater. I think it's also important to talk about the ways in which the mothers of the movement, that is the mothers of these slain children, have come together and organized, mostly through the work of social media, right? Most of this comes out of the work of social movement. And so that's what I'll say, I guess, is my opening for the beginning. Thank you. Well, remind me, please help yourself to the food, okay? There's too many leftovers to take with us. Next, Jeff Lane is assistant, assistant professor in communications in the School of Communication and Information. He's an ethnographer. He's doing field work on and offline in Harlem with teenagers and adults. His recent work looks at the role of social media in criminal case processing and working with partners to develop programs and protections for young people's digital rights. Please welcome Brother Jeff Lane. It's really a pleasure to be part of such an important uh, event and to kind of think about this timeline and this point in history and now kind of um, think a little bit about, should I pick this up? Yeah. So I'm, I'm interested in thinking a little bit about this kind of timeline and some of the figures and some of the men and women that we met and that were depicted in this film and thinking a little bit about what, they're, what they would be like or what the contemporary versions of them might, might be like and what their sort of use of, of technology would be like. And, what kind of presence in public they would adopt and have. And um, I guess one way that I relate to or think about um, social and, and technological change is to, to focus on the people, to, to really remember the, the leaders and the brokers of community and of black communities and focus on, on those folks and think about the ways in which they use technology. Um, and rather than kind of focusing on the tech first, starting on the people. and the social roles that we see in communities, and thinking a little bit about, you know, is there an infrastructure of local people and institutions and media, and are the community organizers and the clergy and the other leaders or middlemen in the community or middlewomen, and I, I mean that term in the sense of those who span multiple wor worlds and connect otherwise estranged parties, um, are they connected to a wide range of generations and stakeholders and channels? Um, and if so, have the allies in the wider, usually whiter world, have they linked in? And, um, and are those in positions of, of established power, are they working to sponsor and strengthen some of these communication networks and processes, or are they uh, instead limiting or suppressing uh, these networks? Um, and thinking about the activist, uh, to Ray uh, McKesson talking about being networked online to both his peers and his allies, but then also to his doubters and his enemies and the authorities, and thinking a little bit about kind of the conundrum of, of visibility online and as a tool for mobilizing and joining people across networks. Um, and I guess one of, the, one of the things that brought me here was um, to this real concern with looking at the people first and looking at their communication and technology use um, and particularly the visibility of their communication and their networks through their technology use is um, um, being inspired by uh, having done outreach work and, and field work in Harlem for a number of years um, alongside a pastor there, um, an African-American man in his 50s who had really reinvented a traditional social role um, in the black community as a middleman between people and institutions and in spanning uh, different worlds um, and had reinvented that by learning ways of communicating that were not part of his childhood in order to connect with youth and be relevant to youth and recognizing that a community also exists in different digital hangouts and digital locations and thinking a little bit about um, how to relate to people on and offline and where the different stakeholders or where the different constituencies are in on and offline space in a community. 
Um, and you know, it's something really interesting was sort of seeing how he was joining um, you know, teenagers on Twitter with adults on text message blasts and then even much finer granulations of uh, different uh, stakeholders beyond the neighborhood and different media uh, groups and thinking about how he was very carefully um, channeling communication to certain people and trying to mobilize as a result. So I'm interested, I guess, in um, how organizing figures and very sort of classic community roles, how they are shifting through new technologies and adjusting for the social media era or not. And if they're not, how is the younger generation of leaders and activists, how are they positioning themselves on and offline in relation to this old guard? Um, so those are some of the things that I'm, I'm curious about. Thanks. Thanks, Jeff. Next, Angela Kumi. Oh, Kumini. Ka. Ka. Yes. Kumini. You got it. I'm practicing that. <laughs> All right, assistant professor in journalism and media studies, rides hard for social justice issues, <laughs> and his podcast on civil gives you a sense of his sensibility and how he uses his creativity, intellect, passion, and research to help inform all of us. Please welcome him. It's smart not to take a chance on the big step. Right. Okay, everybody saw Black Panther? Partner forever? <laughs> um, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. I'm so excited to be here um, with everyone especially with uh, Mr. Long, and to, and to get this historical perspective. I, wow, these chairs are low. Um, <laughs> I, I, I study uh, social media. Can everybody hear me? Because yep. I got a, oh, but for the oh, recording, uh -huh. okay, yeah. So I study social media. Um, I study really what's called creative and cultural industries, which is really just like entertainment and how it intersects with social justice. And so I don't want to really say too much because I want us to get into the interactive part, but a couple of things I would like to say is thinking about what's been said so far, <clears throat> you know, I've I spent the last couple of years being in a lot of protest spaces. I was spent a, a fair amount of time in Ferguson during the time I went to Mike Brown, Michael Brown's funeral. Um, I was in Charleston around the time because I was living in South Carolina when, when that tragedy happened at the um, Mother Emanuel Church. And in North Charleston, I was at Walter Scott's funeral because that was about three hours from where I lived. And so when I think about use of technology, the thing I think about is how are people organizing to basically bring, exert leverage on some of these structures of power, you know? I mean, it's funny, we're sort of having like this Black Panther moment, right, where everybody's really excited about it. And I don't wanna, I, I, you know, I was excited about it because it's an incredible film. But you know, I was listening to uh, Salamisha Tillett um, talking. She's a wonderful uh, Africana scholar in, at U uh, University of Pennsylvania. Who's coming to Rutgers? Who's coming to Newark. Rutgers soon? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. And she 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 raised. She, I, lo I love the way she put this question. It would have took taken me like three hours to say. She said, "What does it mean to win the culture, but you, but you don't have the White House? You know, you don't have the the Supreme Court. You don't have any of the legislative bodies, right?" The way I would have said it is, what does it mean to win the, win the culture, but you don't control the structure? So I'm interested in how young people, really, I want to lift up a lot of young people without fetishizing the youth. The way that in, in those places I've been, young people have become excellent at mobilizing attention, right? I mean, I watched in Ferguson that movement grow, be sustained. I watched in New York, people put 50,000, 60,000 bodies, 20-year-olds put 50,000 bodies on the streets in New York. But at the same time, when I look back to this era of what happened in Birmingham, there was, it wasn't just that there was bodies on the street. There was a certain tactical wisdom of how do, you, how do you maneuver and actually exert power? How do you make a power structure that wants to, you know, that, that has a, a straight up anti-black, anti-brown, anti-women, LGBT, anti-immigrant agenda, right? And it's kind of used to people on the street actually now, right? Like they kind of know, okay, people are gonna come out, they're gonna wear whatever hats they wear, and then they're gonna go back home. How do you force that power structure to actually do what you need it to do? And so I'm really excited here to learn really from um, 
you know, uh, Mr. Long and his generation from the scholarship. And I, and I want also, I just want to underscore, women are always out in front. It was so clear to me, like in all those places I des described, how women and LGBTQ people were out in front of that movement. And then, you know, I would, go, I would go among some of my brothers who are like real strong black nationalists in some cases, they would be like, yeah, you know, I don't know what's, you know, they would, they would have things to say. They wouldn't necessarily be showing the same solidarity, you know. So I'm interested in how technology fits in as a part of that. And um, I just want to throw that out there and, and we can talk. Thank you. Who is Hal Mendez? Javier is a four plus one student here in Sky. I was struck by his talent, passion, and authenticity in our first meeting over a year ago now. And that sentiment remains. I look forward to seeing how he chooses to apply his talent in service. And Javier is going to do his introductory remarks via spoken word. <laughs> Check one, two. I just want to thank everybody for coming out. Give you guys a warm welcome with applause for coming out in this beautiful weather. And I want to thank you for this event. song that I fell upon today during the internet, it's, uh, it's actually Swahili translated to English, um, the, the chorus being Kulikujana, I don't think I'm cool with the chair, the chorus being Kulikujana, that means more than yesterday, and in light of all of the civil rights, uh, and, all, and right, in light of all of the civil rights activism that's been going along, along with the Black Panther movement, we've seen this film from the 1963 era, I have a poem that I read, it's called It Takes a Village to Raise a Child, especially in light of the four little girls, um, and upon watching that film, I was very struck at how, not how they were raised differently, not how they were raised wrong, but how they were raised differently and how they, they controlled themselves in different situations and how they reflected on each other in different, in different times of tragic, and tra uh, uh, tragic need and tragedy. So the piece goes, it takes a village to raise a child. <clears throat> Can anybody hear me without the mic? Is it, do I have to be on the mic? Need it for the I need the mic for the recording? Yeah. Okay, cool. All right, so without further ado, tell the person on your left to listen to this poem. If there's a person on your left. If there's a person to your right, tell them to listen to this Listen poem. up, man. All right. <laughs> yes, sir. It takes a village to raise a child. It takes a village to raise a child. But this village has been broken into. Seasonal venues familiar to what we've been through. I know this notions of daily doctrines, my soul's been rotten as we dish down to the addicted. Brown skin submission to the two, three screen, clamp locks into federal prisons. This, this village is lacking leaders, readers and overseers, able to love the worst people, the ones that hurt people and hate evil and leave their land stand uncovered and search for people. These, this village is lacking fathers. So sons and desperate daughters grow up way too fast, put on the fakest laugh, hoping the pain won't last. This, this village is lacking truth. Where tough love burns the mouth roof, persistent prayers pleading with proof of hope. Knelt knees with Kaepernick. Closed fists and clock guns is what they want us to battle with, but we use slight hand and her verbal ammunition. I use my subject in a predicate. Notice my peaceful etiquette. Leave the legacy of MLK for Christ's sake. I speak to God in public. I speak to God in public. He gave our lives a compass, only to reach the summit. It's up to us to trust it. It's up to us to trust it. Thank you. All right, with that, we'd like to open it up. Questions, comments, statements? I don't mind it at all. In fact, I insist upon it. Okay. Um, 
One of the things that I was thinking about while everyone was talking really is about the fact that the Civil Rights Movement was a high-tech movement of its time. It was the beginning and the, the dawn of TVs in people's homes. It's the first uh, mass movement in American history that has been recorded where we have actual footage of events. We don't have that for any other movement before that. So before you might have a few film snippets, but this was on the news absolutely every single day at the beginning of people's understanding of the news as a delivery of information delivery service. And so there are ways in which the civil rights movement itself was at the forefront of high tech of its time. And so we look at, we look at it from a lens of looking back with the technology that we have and think about it as being low tech, but it actually used every single thing available to it to figure out ways to enact social change. So these people were flying around when nobody was flying. These people were uh, using, they were finding ways to create leaflets and newsletters and other kinds of production without the benefit of smartphones and word perfect or word anything. And so we should acknowledge the ways in which they were the young people of their times who were harnessing the technology of their time to actually figure out ways to engage in social change. And if we think about it that way, then these kids who are organizing on Twitter and Instagram, they really are in the historical line of this, not actually creating something out of whole cloth. If I may, you know, the social media of the time, and don't miss this, was public radio, Tall Paul and uh, Shelly the Playboy, the DJs that told the kids in Birmingham when to meet, what time to meet. The other one was black newspapers, African-American newspapers. And then there were the, uh, how many know, you ever heard of a mimeograph machine? Anybody? Okay. My aunt was taught typing at my high school. You cut a stencil, you run these copies off, you cut them in half and you create flyers that got the word out. And then the other one was uh, from the pulpit. Now, there were telegraphs, there were letters written, but the church during my time was the most powerful element in getting the word out, along with radio and memograph uh, um, uh, documents, word of mouth, telephone, and uh, newspapers. I thought it was important to mention that. local organizing that was happening through technology at that time, um, something that came up when Walter Cronkite got on, um, and something that actually a lot of our social media scholarship now draws on is an event in the late 60s um, when H. Rap Brown was first going to be um, on a national, I don't remember if it was television or radio broadcast, and it was the first time that he would be using um, a black vernacular or talking about black issues and he was trying to decide would he change how he spoke or would he how would he address a broader and white audience and it was for um, white people one of the first times that they were exposed to some of the activist issues and thinking a little bit about what Walter Cronkite said about this event um, galvanizing um, white people as well um, it's interesting to kind of think about some of the social boundary crossings that can happen through technology um, that we often associate with social media, but um, that we can really, you know, go back quite a bit and, and think about um, national broadcasts and think about other other tech change as well. I have a question from the audience for the panel. First of all, the online audience says hello. hello. Um, since there was this, this was the start of technology being used to show brutality and abuse. Do and this is to any of the panelists. Are there any differences to what happened then? as to what is happening now. You know, it was, it was very smart from the leaders in Birmingham and in the South during that time to take advantage of TV, for example. There was no way possible for the world to know what was going on in Birmingham had it not been for television. Uh, the key uh, TV news broadcast was the Huntley Brinkley Report. My parents swore by it, and they, they were always there to watch to see what the national media, because 
it brought attention, the brutality that you saw, the hoses, the dogs, the things that didn't make a whole lot of sense in terms of human dignity, what, what blast across TV screens throughout the world. And it was done strategically because Dr. King and Shuttlesworth and the leaders in the movement wanted the world to see how people of color and African Americans were being treated in Birmingham during that time. So it was extremely important and it was used strategically back in Birmingham 60 years ago. I think the biggest difference is there was no on-demand service. There was no sort of, there was no YouTube. And so even for instance, when you think about the fact that when Emmett Till was killed, his mother insisted on an open casket, a picture of his casket was carried in Jet Magazine and Ebony Magazine. So it made it into lots of households. It was on the front page of Chicago newspapers and almost all black newspapers. So lots of people saw his bloated body. But what they didn't have was the ability to pull it up and watch it over and over and over again. And so there's a way in which all of that exposure can start to seem macabre, can start to turn violence into something fantastical rather than actually elicit the emotions that we want from violence. Um, I think about how one day I'm watching CNN or one of those channels, and literally it's like a Brady Bunch effect. You know how we have multiple screens on one, all of black people being killed by the police. And at some point, the thing that I've been saying over the last few years is we have to establish some kind of ethic around this. It is traumatizing. It is, um, it is both traumatizing to the people who understand the experience and desensitizing to the people who are watching it and, and who don't care. And so there's a way in which this on-demand version, and that's not just true of the civil rights movement, that's all these beheading videos around the war. There's lots of instances of this where you can just go and find information. So think about in Four Little Girls, how we see those pictures of those little girls' bodies. You better believe that wasn't shown on TV mm. at the time. This is something we now have access to, and he has chosen to show as a part of, as Spike Lee has chosen to show as a part of this movie. But back then, no one was publishing this kind of stuff. You couldn't just pull it up whenever you felt like it. And so it changes the nature of how we understand violence and how we understand the ritualized nature of it and how we uh, come to think about the quantity of how much of it we get. Perhaps in the room, comments, questions? That was problematic because it takes a while to write a letter and express your opinion. Now, if you happen to be friends with the local disc jockey, you can get information out or you can get your opinion out. Every now and then, the major newspaper, the Dallas, I mean, the Birmingham News and the Birmingham Post Herald, would sometimes publish letters written by African American pe uh, people about their opinions of what was going on. But when you sent the letter, you did it at a big risk because that was, you know, retaliation. That could mean a beating, house being bombed, or burned, or kids being harmed, or anything, because that was, it was, it was domestic terrorism. And it was used to intimidate people. So people dare not write letters to the paper. But we had an effective means of getting the word out. Sometimes it was a little underground. It's also important for you young people to know, younger people to know that the news in, 19, in the 1960s was 15 minutes a day. Mm -hmm. 15 minutes a day. 
not 20, there was no 24 hour, I mean the TV didn't stay on for 24 hours. It's off at Period. midnight. It went off at some point. Yeah. And so it's important to think about the ways in which people even receive news at that point. I think it's interesting also to think about, um, you know, exercising your, your free speech and, and criticizing a leader or speaking back to something um, that, that you're disturbed by and that that it's a double-edged sword and that um, and I think this also goes back um, that you know you you're creating a, a record of your resistance and as you know protests are, are filmed and, and videoed and discussed online um, there's a record of who participated or who potentially organized or how these networks connected and you know it's something that that police and, and and government have always been sort of sensitive to these kinds of lists these networks anywhere where it's tangible or visible to how people are connected around resistance or protest it's you know the other side of the organizing potential and the exposure potential is you know using it as a tool to create rosters and lists and surveillance projects um, and that's always a really sort of tricky um, tricky piece to it and it's something that we you know we hear about in the US we hear about it in authoritarian regimes in all sorts of countries. It's something that we know about social media now, too, is this sort of two-sidedness to it. And even though there are supposed to be protections in place um, that allow people to organize freely on the internet, if it's uh, treated as a public safety concern, then it can then police ha can exercise their power to, to do this sort of surveillance project. And of course, how that's labeled is, is, a, is a funny issue, too, right? So, Look what happened to uh, Colin Kaepernick. He was blackballed from the NFL because of his social position on police brutality. None of the stuff that we heard the next day from the White House to the city council all over the country, people took what he did out of context, made it into something else, and it has hurt him and other NFL men of color tremendously. Yeah, I would just also speak to, you know, this, the surveillance. I mean, I, th and I think it's interesting to think about the ways in which surveillance was operating at that time during the 60s and now. Um, but certainly, you know, social media is often celebrated as this great, wonderful tool of social movements. But the, I've witnessed in person how, how serious the surveillance is, um, particularly with things like live stream. Everybody has a tendency to throw up the Facebook Live and all that. I mean, and I remember you know, specifically watching, poli police would watch that in, in like Ferguson and Charleston, mm -hmm. and they used that, and they definitely used it. Um, I remember getting a really interesting account from people in Occupy New York about how the police used that to dismantle that protest, and I think in Occupy Pittsburgh, specifically watching a live stream to dismantle the encampment, and, and then also to arrest people. Um, so I think, yeah, I mean, I just think that's an that's a, that's a interesting thing that's not talked about enough when we talk about when we sort of celebrate social media, you know, as, the, as a key agent. And Tindra, I wonder if you could speak more, I mean, we talked earlier about the notion of terrestrial radio, and right. I hadn't thought about terrestrial radio in years, but this notion of how it's hard to surveil people who are listening over the airway, I wonder if you could, in, on, under the um, sort of the, uh, uh, under the topic of, of renaming, uh, sort of uh, clinging to your anonymity, via terrestrial radio as a way to right. receive messages. Well, I mean, I, you know, I mean, there's a long history of radio, and I think that one of the things about the technologies we have now, which I think are really useful in some ways, is that they're also things we don't really, we have limited control over. We don't control these platforms. They're also very expensive. They're not necessarily accessible to people. You know, you got phones in your pocket that might cost five, six, seven hundred dollars. Um, and so there's a long history of people using radio as a community media institution. Um, and uh, earlier, Mr. Long was telling me about the importance of radio. In fact, could you talk about the importance of radio uh, in, in Birmingham? Sure, sure. Uh, again, the uh, drive time, both morning and evening disc jockeys, Paul White and Shelly Stewart, back in the day in Birmingham, uh, got the word out about the movement on their morning and evening radio shows. As a matter of fact, the Klan every now and then would bomb the broadcast antennas because they understood the importance of what those uh, TV, those radio shows meant and how they were effectively used to get the word out uh, in Birmingham. Now I listen to 
right wing talk radio in Dallas just to see what folk who don't think like me are up to. And every now and then I recognize people, their voices, because in some cases I might know them personally or work with them or anything else. So radio is an important uh, uh, means and an important factor. Speaking of surveillance. <laughs>
And so if you're friending people you don't know, then it's easy to just bust, to bust up into places and just start tearing things down. And so that's really a problem of the proliferation, right? And that is, it's even easier now to embed fake news, fake people. It's easier than it's ever been. And so, you know, Mark, you know, Mark and Gates said, you know, believe, you know, what is it? Some of what you believe and half of what you hear. It's true for social media. Okay, let's take one last question before we have to wrap up. Or two, one. Okay, please. Um, so for like the recent Black Lives Matter movement, because we've had multiple in the past, I feel like, well, it's more of a question. Do you feel like this new movement lacks the faith aspect? Because like during these older girls' time, most of the galvanizing was through a religion, you know, like people's hardcore faith. Like, do y'all believe that? the Black Lives Movement today just lacks that one leadership and one faith base. Can you rephrase the question? She's asking you about faith in the role of, I feel like I'm taking on this. But anyway, I'm sorry about that. She's asking about the role of faith, faith in the Four Little Girls movie and the role of faith in organizations and movements now like Black Lives Matter. One of the things you'll see at almost all Black Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter events is a healing space. And so while they are not strictly Christian, they're not Christian at all, they're not affiliated with any religion, you will have people who are there to deal with trauma. So you'll have people who are doing Reiki, you have people who are burning sage, but you'll also have quiet places, you'll have people who are praying with you if you want. You have all of, you have a, a much more varied sense of spiritualness and the need for healing because they recognize the ways in which people were traumatized without any resources to deal with it in previous movements. And so they still continue in many places to use church spaces. That part hasn't actually changed a whole lot. They use church spaces in Philadelphia, they use charter schools, they use any place they can find, and oftentimes those places are religious spaces. And so, but I, I, would, I would just say, you know, I mean, like I live in South Carolina, right? So it was it was tricky in that. Um, one thing I can say, the Black Lives Matter movement has created a, a more, I would argue, probably a more inclusive space. You know, one of the things right. about um, you know critiques about the civil rights movement is while it was tremendous. Women leadership, there's tremendous LGBTQ leadership. Um, those people necessarily couldn't always be themselves fully uh, and didn't get the credit that they deserve. So um, that's different where that, that, you know, those kind of identities are centered, I think, in these movements from what I've seen. And I think that, you know, it's, it's tricky. The politics of the church are very interesting. Sometimes there's a generational thing about what movement building is. But I do think that that's a thing. I, at times when I look at like the, the organizational power, you know, in a place, for example, like South Carolina, there was plenty of times I was like, wow, I, I wish we could have mobilized the church more effectively. Um, because, you know, it's just an already organized body of people. And if they weigh in, they can control elections, they can control, you know, the politics. Basically. Your question really hits at the like, essential debate in, in the social media and social movements literature, too. And, um, you know, one of the critiques is that, not so much in terms of faith, I think it's interesting that you're thinking about faith specifically, but, you know, with, with black civil rights in the 60s and the timeline that we engaged with in the film, um, the idea of, of the church as a kind of hub of extra-religious activity and social life and organization, very sort of strong ties between neighbors, family, church, all that kind of coming together, and, and you get the sense of people who really know each other, like they are, they know each other's families, they've been to big school together, it's really, you get a sense of tightness in that movie of these people who see them decades later, they can still talk about hanging out together in a way, you know, you know, you know they really know each other. And one of the, one of the critiques is that um, back in that time, so the social movements were organized through people who really had skin in the game, they really knew each other, it was a strong tie phenomenon based in these physical churches on 16th Street that really, you know, really key hubs, and that now it's more of a sort of weak tie phenomenon and more diffuse, and that you know something like ha hashtag activism or something like that, it doesn't have that same intimacy. But I think that's, I mean, I think there's some truth to that maybe. I also think it's somewhat 
a measure of how we conceptualize and study these things too. And I think um, one of the reasons why I was saying I, I really like to, think, to start with the people is I think if we actually spent time with activists and their families and the people around them and we didn't study them just online, but on and offline, and we really spent time with them and we engaged them and asked them questions, we would have a sense more of these actual intimate ties that I think still do exist. But it's a real, it's, you're hitting at a real debate here. Are we getting kind of a thinner version of activism or not? I do think there is a way in which social media, however, creates a drag culture. It creates mm -hmm. a call out culture that's particularly mean, that doesn't allow for process, uh, that makes it difficult for people to go, um, to grow. Um, one of my friends is like, it's so funny that, it, like, how many people make fun of the church because they create this saint or sinner? But there's no place where there's more of a saint or sinner creation than on Twitter and Instagram, right? And so the thing that actually, so I believe they are actually, I believe it's thick, right? I believe that they are creating relationships. I believe that this is a way that people create relationships yeah. now. They get to know each other fairly well, mostly because they share so much information about themselves. Yeah. I mean, it's curated information, but they share it. And um, anyway, but what they don't get is the opportunity to process and to learn and grow in social media spaces. If you're lucky, you have people to do that with offline. But if you're not, you're either a winner or a loser in any particular moment. And then everybody else, once they see which one you are, they just sort of pile on to see what's actually happening. And that leads to, I think, some reticence of some people to be involved in social media work. You, know, you can go to church nowadays and never leave home. You know, you can pay your money if you choose to through PayPal or something, and you never develop these personal relationships because I will tell you that Addie, Simpson, Denise, and Carol were my friends. I, I have photographs that I cherish of all of us on those photographs. Vacation Bible school, Sunday school, Christmas plays, Easter patterns, church orchestra. We all knew each other because we were there at 16th Street Church almost any day of the week. Personal relationships that nowadays you may not find because you, you watch, you go to church, what I call pillow battles. Yeah. I just had one quick question. Um, one of the things that really struck me was the, the simplicity of the, the, the language that was used in the video. And what really struck me first was Walter Cronkite when he said that um, it was just mean. I mean, he said it was just mean. I thought, well, that's really simple. It's just mean. But when someone asked a small child while they, why they were marching, he said, for my freedom, for our freedom. And I'm curious. I mean, he said, they boiled it down to very, something very simple. But now, I mean, you guys kind of said it, it's very, it's simple, but it's very complicated, and it's almost um, that we need to put one word would you sum up what people are trying to um, bring to the top, bring to the surface as far as what we're talking about. What one word would each of you use? I would say people want to be free. I'll say, I'll say love. And I know, I know Charles talked about it, I know uh, we've we'll, we'll spoken about it, but the concept is to love each other and to, and to not only empathize, not only sympathize, but to empathize with that next person and to go back to what the panelists were saying about those close ties between communities. I think that it's a, it's a concept of like a soul tie. And I know you personally, I'm not going to do anything wrong, but if I know you on the internet, totally. right. <laughs> if, I know you, if I know you through the internet, it's more of a buy, it's more of a let's, let's organize for this cause and I like and repost your things when I see you on my feed. And I think it's more of a soul thing. And going back to the faith thing, I think now, personally, through the activism and the, uh, the civil rights that we're going through right now, um, it's less of a faith in God, but less of a faith in each other. And I think that's a huge part that we're missing. I'd say maybe community, and how we're all grappling with where, who's the insiders and who's the outsiders, and how do we measure community, and what does it mean to, to be part of it, to feel part of it, to feel empowered in the community. I would probably say power. My word is simply truth, and to be able to discern <coughs> what that is. Tyree? Yeah, um, so now that we're living in a technological era, um, we have access to, a, to an abundance of information, <coughs> whether it's from the internet or from social media. Um, and young people, we sort of take on that technology dynamics 
um, with the on-demand interaction as far as our social, um, our social life and our social interaction. Um, and with that being said, we tend to lose momentum in certain causes, especially if it's not close to home. Um, so with that being said, my question really is, <coughs> how can we change the social dynamics of um, younger individuals to create a form of commitment towards the cause, um, either with the use of technology or outside of the use of technology? I have a, I response to that. You know, uh, as an organizer, you know, the one thing I would say is, Imani Perry, a wonderful scholar at Princeton, basically recently answered a similar question to what you're saying this way. She said, it's really important for you to find an organization that you can commit to for 10 years or more. Um, and she said that to people. I thought that was an interesting way of thinking about it. But I would also say that we have a tendency to think about moments like this thing that's happening in Washington today. And the, or, the older organizers that I've um, learned from talk about campaign building, right? Really thinking about everything in terms of a campaign that's going to end in a particular structure if you want to change. So a lot of times, your, your ability to enact a campaign, I found out, for example, like traveling to Ferguson, I had to leave Ferguson because I lived in South Carolina. I went to, you know, I traveled to Charleston, but Charleston was four hours away. The campaigns I could really be involved with were the ones that were in my area, you know what I mean? And I could lend certain support. So I think, you know, and then one last thing I'll say is one example of the campaign was the students in Missouri. You know, I became friends with those, with a lot of those students. And uh, Ayanna Poole, who's one of the key student leaders, she said that in order to organize that, they had to go offline, they had to really establish trust among the people that they knew, and they had to, you know, because if you online, all the things we're talking about, the surveillance, and they had to commit to a long-term program that would involve a lot of writing notes, a lot of in-person meetings, and those kind of things. Um, I think it's important, I mean, this is going to sound really cynical, but um, there's no movement that ever um, is planned by a bunch of people. Oftentimes what you see is a core group of really committed people who are able to mobilize lots of people when they need them. And so one of the things you'll find is that even though Martin Luther King was welcome in the 16th Street Baptist Church, he wasn't welcome in most churches. Right. Most black churches. Dallas. were not interested in Martin Luther King coming into their doors. And so when you think about it that way, the thing you should know is most social change happens with a small group of people in rooms trying to figure out strategies to change the world. Now, when you need to, you have to be able to convince larger numbers of people to participate in ways that are important. But don't expect it to be a situation for most movements, especially not sustained movements, for it to be a situation where you're going to have hundreds of people involved in the day to day. That's as true for the civil rights movement as it is for the movement for black lives. People who went to Ferguson, that was real exciting, but many of those people have gone back to their daily lives and you have a core group of activists in the movement for black lives in any particular city who's doing all the work all the time, and then they use social media to get people out, get bodies out, when they actually need them. And so that's just part of how it works. Okay, with that, we're going to ask Ross to uh, conclude our event. Let's all thank our panel. <laughs> I'm Professor Ross Todd, I'm Chair of the Department of Library and Information Science, and we have be one of the sponsors of this really wonderful event tonight. I want to give my greetings to our online students and of course to many of our on-campus students who are here this evening. It's just lovely to see you and have you part of this. I want to thank uh, Professor Charles Santeo, he's a wonderful person for masterminding and bringing this event particularly significant in that it is Black History Month. You know, I grew up in the outback in Australia and at 12 or 13, I'm not going to betray 
quite yet, which is rich. Living in the outback, I grew up totally immune, ignorant of these events. Even though as a family on a farm, we sat around the radio at night, listening and trying to understand what was going on in the world so far removed from our farm life reality. That film, Four Little Girls, didn't that haunting music, Birmingham Sunday, doesn't it just grab you in right away? I will sing you a song, a song of freedom, of human dignity, of justice, and that voice that came through, I want equal rights like everyone else. That was so beautiful and so compelling. You know, and this might seem strange that I will say this, at the heart of this song and at the heart of the film was the challenge of being colorblind. Removing the incomprehensible indignity and injustice of skin deep judgment and understanding the richness and beauty of humanity, whoever we are and wherever we are. And so that was just such a wonderful uh, thing about this movie. And Dale, thank you so much, you know, your wisdom, your grace, your presence for being here and taking up our invitation here. I'm greatly indebted to you. Please thank Dale. Was to deeply personalise the experiences of Birmingham, but more than that, you helped us begin to understand what we need to do. You took us there too. And we were there, and I thought that was just a wonderful uh, gift that you have in bringing us into that experience in a deeply powerful way. Professor Price, the, the way that you characterised the four little girls in our national consciousness, I just thought that was so deeply compelling drawing our attention to violence in all of its forms and the way that, that as a society, as cultures, we ritualise violence. You had a very powerful and I think, you know, very compelling sense of what we need to do. Your reference to mothers, I've lost mine, was so compelling because that's at the heart of community, that's at the heart of the endeavours I loved what you said, Jeff, Professor Jeff Lane from our school. The concept of community resonated so strongly in the film. This notion of faith, this notion of searching for truth, this notion of community bringing us together. And you took us into the contemporary setting. You moved us from the film to what's happening around us today. And, and I think that underpinning what you're saying in the work you do with children is how do we, as professionals, many of you are going out and, and working as information and communication professionals, how do, we, how do we educate for a civil, informed and active society? And that was a really important part of uh, your message. Uh, Professor Kumunika, what a joy to have you here. And you pointed out that the forms of engagement, as many of you have said, have changed dramatically. But the, but the challenge is there. That same single challenge is so pervasive. How do we break down the power structures that are so sadly created these situations which encompass us. How do we do that? And the, the ways that the, the engagement, that active engagement was so strong. Javier, 
I wish I could clone this young man <laughs> a thousand times. <laughs> Your message, quote, more than yesterday. Isn't that it? More than yesterday. I just thought, can it be more simple? Can it be more elegant? Can it be more powerful? And yet, can it be more challenging? Thank you, Xavier. We're really honoured to have you here. You know, as I thought about all of this, and I aghast at what is happening, the, the uh, shooting in, in Florida, for example, we can't wait for bombings. We can't wait for shootings to provoke national outrage. We can't wait. You see, as I've listened to each of you and the message that you've given, and the message of that film, it begins in us. It's a village of one. I love what you were saying uh, in terms of we can't wait for the big movement. It's groups of one or two or three in rooms dreaming and, and taking action. And I think that was wonderful. So we're, we're, you know, you as students in the information and communication industries, we're challenged to be a part of that awakening. We're challenged to continue to sing the song that was so powerful at the opening of that uh, film. And, and my takeaway is that we have such a fundamental responsibility to act boldly in our own spheres of interest, our professional circles, our academic circles, our, our social circles, to act boldly in our spheres of interest. Thank you for taking us on this journey. I'm just deeply honoured to be here and I learned so much. We have a really important challenge of educating our young people. And I love the remarks, people want to be free. That's what it is, people want to be free. Thank you very much for a wonderful <laughs>